I want to, uh, before I even begin this morning, uh, thank you, Reverend Kinman, for uh, this warm welcome here today to the congregation that has been my home church now for 18 years, ever since I was blessed to join the inheritors of the sacred marriage between my synagogue, Leo Beck Temple, and All Saints Church, a marriage hatched against the backdrop of war in Vietnam by Reverend George Regis and Rabbi Leonard Behrman, both of blessed and empowering memory. Like you, I am missing Reverend Regis so deeply already. His warmth, his loving countenance, his laser sharp propulsion toward justice and compassion. To this community, which grieves his loss in a way that is all your own. I feel blessed to have this opportunity so soon after his death to offer my heartfelt condolences to each and every one of you, along with my steadfast determination to press forward as his enduring partner in building a world animated by love. Across all the Christmases and actions and programs that I have been gifted to share with this congregation, Reverend Regis unfailingly received me as a brother on the path, as did Reverend Ed Bacon, who remains among my dearest and most cherished friends. And now Reverend Kinman, who instantly took to this holy congregational marriage we share with vigor. Joining us at Leo Beck on our High Holy Days, welcoming me at Christmas time, and most of all, partnering with determination in our joint commitment to bring the teachings of our faith traditions out into a world in need, taking to the streets and courtyards and protests and rallies, and as advocates in the halls of law and government. My life is so much richer because of you, Reverend Kinman and you, All Saints Church. And I am honored so profoundly by this invitation to join you in prayer today. Look, cries the psalmist, look, the eye of the faithful one is on those who revere her, on those who hope in her faithful love. The psalmist's excitement literally leaps off the page. Look, it really happens. When we trust in her love, when we lean into love, we can feel her looking right back at us. Perhaps the psalmist is so excited at this revelation because even when those words were first written, it was rare and harder than we wish to lean into love. We come to this beautiful community, all of us, to build that muscle, to restore that impulse when it starts to flag, a victim of cynical times and those who manipulate us to hate. It's hard in times like these, not to stray, at least occasionally, beyond the frame of the faithful one's return glance. Like you, I have my moments. Late this past summer, my family and I escaped for a little change of venue, a hiking trip up in the Sierras. Good for the body and good for the soul, until we started noticing how many people were hiking without face masks in defiance of all the many posted signs. Some at least went to the trouble of pulling their shirts up over their faces as they saw us coming, but many simply walked right up to us, faces uncovered, greeted us politely as if there were no pandemic, and later just continued on their way. I tried not to let this get under my skin, tried but did not succeed, attrition, took over. The more smiling, maskless hikers we passed, the angrier I felt myself becoming about the hubris, the insensitivity, the danger they posed to others, and not just here on the trails, 
And gradually I could feel my revulsion at their decision becoming a revulsion at them. Presumptions welling up inside me about who they were, what they believe, where their allegiances lie, all their falsehoods. I felt myself starting to migrate from hating what they did to just hating them. Look, begs the psalmist, but I wasn't looking. And I'm hardly alone, especially now. You see, most of us take comfort in seeing our ideological adversaries as the purveyors of hate, not us. After all, it's easy to see the hate packed into Derek Chauvin's knee as it choked the life out of George Floyd for nearly nine unthinkable minutes. Easy to see the hate churning amid a marauding mob erecting gallows outside our nation's capital. Less easy to see for what it is, the hatred we contribute to the march of human degradation. And even when we do see it, we are quick to justify it or defend it since its targets so richly deserve it, or so we say to ourselves. I won't speak for you, but for my own part, I will confess that I have grown weary and ashamed of the hatred I tolerate in myself. Or as the late hero, John Lewis put it, I have found that hate is too heavy a burden to bear. It does not make me better. It does not make me more effective at catalyzing change. It only makes me meaner. I like myself much less with all this hatred churning in me. And it is debilitating, exhausting, to hate, isn't it? Haven't you grown weary of toting your hatred around, weighing yourself down with an impulse you know is destructive to yourself and to the cause of justice in whose name you likely defend it? Yes, hatred is being commoditized all around us and in us. To escape the destructiveness of hate is to swim against a mighty current these days. And yet not a single one of us actually wants to be more hateful, even if we feel our hatred is warranted. So what to do to stop this? The answer of course is what it has always been, the only antidote to hate remains love. Look, pleads the psalmist. Look, the eye of the faithful one is on those who revere her, on those who hope in her faithful love. Now, I know it is hazardous to talk about love while family members and friends are excising each other from their lives because they see things so differently. I get that this is a moment when love sounds at best quaint and at worst dangerously naive. Of course, if you're thinking that right now, it's probably worth pausing long enough to consider what this moment in history has done to you. We are here to ask ourselves not who we can defend being, or who the world has beaten us into being. We are here to ask, who do we want to be? Do we want to throw in with the cynics who believe the worst about humankind or the visionaries who have architected the best in humankind over and over again throughout history? When we think of our heroes, is there a single one of them who gratified our impulse to hate? I know it's fashionable to consider this the most fraught moment ever. And in fact, it may be the most fraught moment in our own lifetimes. But are we really vain enough to think that we happen to live in the one and only moment that is so dark and cynical that it is immune to love? Plenty of the greatest practitioners of love in our countries and our world's history 
people like John Lewis, stuck with love, even in the face of hatred so deadly it would make us blanch. Are we strong enough, brave enough to do the same? On this glorious Sunday morning, I am banking that you are not too far submerged in this cesspool of hate to hear me out about love. Not the facile type of love that makes us all roll our eyes because we as a nation are staring down deep dangers right now. I'm talking about the kind of love that is larger, more steadfast than those deep dangers. The love that defeats those dangers. As most of you know, the first five books of the Hebrew scriptures are known in the Jewish tradition as the Torah. And in the Torah, we are commanded to love in only three very specific ways. We are to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. We are to love the stranger, the most often com repeated command in the entire Torah. And we are to love our God. That's the commanded love list in Judaism. A cherished teacher of mine, Rabbi Sheila Weinberg, explains that these are not, in fact, three distinct types of love. Rather, they are a process. We draw upon our love of self in learning how to love the people we know, those closest to us, how to want for them what we want for ourselves. We then allow our practice of loving those we know to teach us how to love those we don't know the stranger, near and far, including those who may be really hard for us to love. And when we succeed in doing that, we have cultivated the capacity to love God. And here we're not talking about loving a remote or distant being. We're talking about becoming vessels of love who increase the store of love throughout all that lives. That is when and how the faithful one looks us in the eye with her love. A beautiful teaching, simple to describe, very, very hard to do, especially when so much hatred is being directed at us. But Rabbi Weinberg is on to something, I think, by defining love as a gift we understand first as that which we long for ourselves, so we can want it for everyone else. That doesn't feel so far-fetched. After all, it's not as if we expect amorous affection from everyone we meet. We do, however, see ourselves as worthy of some important things denied to those who are hated. Dignity, grace, empathy, fairness. We begin by wanting these for the people we know so that we can grow into wanting them for the people we don't. And it seems that science aligns with the Torah in this regard as there's evidence that humans' ability to hate may actually be an evolutionary adaptation, one that made it easier for a group of hunter-gatherers to justify taking scarce food from competing groups. This we understand. After a summer which ripped our country's racial fissures wide open, crescendoing months later into a white supremacist insurrection, we are staring into the garish light, illuminating systemic disadvantage all around us, from the neighborhoods where only some can live to the schools only some can attend, from the dangers posed by law enforcement to the dangers posed by COVID-19. Systemic imbalances, all of them, which we tolerate only because they are mostly in our favor. If hate was an evolutionary adaptation designed to enable us to feel more at peace while taking more of the scarce food for ourselves. Well, then love isn't some sort of mushy, warm-heartedness toward those who have less. 
love is wanting all people to have the same shot at the scarce food. Love is wanting to reform the systems that promote unfairness to anyone, loving our neighbor as we love ourselves and loving even those least like us as we love those most like us, filling the world with that kind of love. That we tend to resist this type of logic because we see people who traffic in hatred much more than we do, whose hatred is in fact often aimed at us. Do we owe even them this kind of love? Well, I would certainly not be the first to make that case to this holy community. But today I'm thinking about someone who did so even before Reverend Regis came to All Saints Church. Someone especially on our minds always at this time of year. Someone who had much, much more to fear from hate than you or I do, even now. These words are from one of the lesser known sermons of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He delivered it at his church in Montgomery in November of 1957, almost two years after Rosa Parks' courage turned that city into a raging inferno of hate, almost two years after his home was bombed by a white supremacist. So if you think you've got a high bar to get over on your way to loving your adversary, think about King's Bar and listen to how reminiscent his words are of the Torah, of Rabbi Weinberg, and of the psalmist. Preached Dr. King, in order to love your enemies, you must begin by analyzing self. Within the best of us, there is some evil, and within the worst of us, there is some good. The person who hates you most has some good in him, even the nation, that hates you most has some good in it. Even the race that hates you most has some good in it. And when you come to the point that you look in the face of every man and see deep down within him what religion calls the image of God, you begin to love him in spite of. No matter what he does, you see God's image there. Love. Dr. King continued, is not this sentimental something that we talk about. It is the refusal to defeat any individual. When you rise to the level of love, of its great beauty and power, you seek only to defeat evil systems. Individuals who happen to be caught up in that system you love, but you seek to defeat the system. If you hate your enemies, you have no way to redeem or to transform your enemies. But if you love your enemies, said Dr. King, you will discover that at the very root of love is the power of redemption. You just keep loving people and keep loving them, even though they're mistreating you. It seems to me that this is the only way as our eyes look to the future. as our eyes look to the future, what will they see? The psalmist urges, look, the eye of the faithful one is on those who revere her, on those who hope in her faithful love. We yearn to know what does that glance feel like when we lean into love. The longtime rabbi in residence of All Saints Church, Reverend Regis's partner and friend, Rabbi Leonard Bierman of blessed memory, said it this way. Yes, there are always enemies of hope all about us and in us but there are also allies everywhere. There is a lot of love out there. 
there is in truth in every one of us a coercion to love. Feel it. Feel it. It cannot be stifled. Amen. Amen.